Hey, uh, a couple of things. There's been a lot of citation of tobacco campaigns and the fact that fear based, but it divorces, that discussion's been divorced from the reality that there's a lot more resources in tobacco than there are in HIV. The, the tobacco campaigns did, I mean, I don't even know how many nicotine patches you sent out, but it did provide a very concrete resource for people. And for those of us living with HIV, those resources are important, and these campaign, the campaign that's currently out does not. But the other thing that kind of bothered me is that there's a lot of discussion around evaluating campaigns, and it's not rocket science, but it is social science. And many of us are trained social scientists. And the method that you're citing, the focus groups, you know, they're good for message testing, they discuss norms really well, but they're not exactly, I mean, to be honest, they're not the same kind of evaluation that you did for tobacco. Tobacco, you did outcome evaluations measured over five years. Um, and, you know, and, and let's not <laughs> pretend that this is an outcome evaluation or that folks surveying people that work in your agency is a way of testing and success. <laughs> Actually, if you were doing a, if you were developing a candy bar, you wouldn't go to Hershey's to focus group it, right? <laughs> so we live in a very different reality. And um, the other thing, I really wanted to thank Les for Les's diversity of his campaigns. Um, when I look at, uh, I am an expert in social marketing, and when, one of the things that you should know is that HIV Stops With Me has an effect over time. People remember the campaign. Thank you. Any responses yet, Dr. Cutler? And um, there's a lot of hands up now, so please keep your questions brief. Uh, I certainly don't mean to be answering all of these questions, but I think they're directed to me, so. Uh, um, I think that you would, being a social scientist and doing social marketing, you know that there are different time periods for doing different things. Um, focus grouping, uh, the focus grouping had to do with message development um, and developing the spot. You are absolutely right that outcome evaluation is critical and it takes time to do subsequent to the campaign, uh, during and or subsequent to the campaign. So there's certainly many ways in which this campaign will be evaluated, but we have to get there first, which is to have it disseminated and out there and people seeing it, and then assess people's reactions, people's behavior. There are process indicators and outcome indicators. Process meaning how many times was it shared, how many impressions were delivered, how many times did it go viral, meaning circulated. And I'd like to say, you know, at last check, this just in terms of process, uh, you know, this, this video was shared on YouTube 122,000 times. HIV Stops With Me about two weeks ago, I checked uh, uh, most recently, was less than 2,000 times. So, I mean, just getting seen, as Les mentioned, is very, very important. And also, to be fair, that campaign has been around a long time, so it might have been seen a lot earlier on. Uh, those are the process, some process indicators, but then outcomes, you have to look at behavior, intention, uh, and the ultimate outcome, which is surveillance, epidemiology, and new infection. So that takes a while to go through those stages. Why did Dr. Monica Sweeney leave? Uh, oh, no, I think she was taking yeah. a call. Uh, yes. I'm, okay, I'm Dr. Norma Goodwin, and I have a website that specifically provides health information for people of color. And um, everyone here, I'm sure, knows about the disparity in terms of HIV and, for example, African American and then the Hispanic community. I've not really heard discussion of, we can say they need messages. While a PSA doesn't necessarily stop HIV, we need messages directed to those communities. And I've heard more discussion tonight in criti critiquing the health department message and talking about what the message should be for those who are disproportionately affected. We still need to know what the message should be. And if segmented marketing and social marketing holds, what should the message be for men and what should the message be for women? Because I don't think they would be the same. Thank you. So does anybody want to talk about you know, moving forward, some, some new approaches we might take, some new messages? particularly addressing uh, racial disparities. And the CDC just came out with new, their latest data, which show that uh, African Americans are half of new infections in the US from 05 to 08, even though they're only about 13 half percent of the population. Um, so really striking disparities. Uh, and that's true among gay men as well as women. Anyone want to talk? Um, 
Okay, then let's go to uh, the audience and Krishna, the yeah. next person is um, Nathan in the back. You want to skip? Okay, thank you. Um, so the purple check shirt, or the, pur the striped shirt behind Nathan. Thank you. Um, I just want, I wanted to, my name is Charles. I want to directly address the issue about the, these focus groups that occurred. I'm wondering if we can have transcripts of these because that's, that's been my biggest issue is like, who are these people that you were talking to and where are they? Because from the community groups that I've spoken to, it doesn't seem that any outreach was done to people on the ground. And so that's the most upsetting part about it. I mean, it's me and the idea that you're trying to reach a population that you doesn't seem like you actually talk to. So, um, and I, I think I wanted to just reiterate the point of like secondary provision, like what are we talking about situations around people who are positive and their interaction with negative people and what, how that works and how people negotiate those situations. I really appreciate that that came up as a topic area. Um, and, and just I mean, talking about adherence even as an issue for people who are already positive and their account or their possibility to infect others. I think that that was also mentioned. And I, I, I think it's just, the idea of a community viral load, um, if I'm a gay black man, am I sleeping with other gay black men and like how much HIV is in my community and like how we deal effectively with those issues are all topics I think are ways to move forward and how to, it addresses the issue of it not being a uh, behavior versus community versus other institutional type of situation. And I think those are kind of more helpful conversations to be had, but I'm wondering if the department particularly is going to be able to provide that kind of transcripts of those, the research that you did prior to making this ad. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, HIV negative people are discriminated in research. There's no reason to uh, I'll answer that briefly, and then I would actually like to hear from the rest of the panelists uh, on the prior question, because yes. I thought that was good. Uh, the, the focus group transcripts will not be released. That's internal information to the department. However, we worked with it. An advertising agency to develop a campaign that worked with a company that specializes in recruiting, uh, conducting focus groups, recruiting uh, individuals for focus groups. And I will say that there are some individuals here in this room who actually were part of the focus groups. Um, so not to, you know, out anybody, but I mean uh, that is a fact. And um, so. So there are certainly members of the community who were part of it. And I think you asked about community viral load. Is that a uh, yeah, question? Sorry. Okay, so. Um, so going back to the previous question, I'd just like to respond with, with a couple of ideas um, in terms of how to do prevention differently. Um, in the report, which I've mentioned a couple of times, which is outside the room, grab a copy, um, we um, highlight a number of approaches that we take with uh, HIV prevention with gay men, and one is encouraging parents to accept their gay sons. And there's research that shows that parents who accept their gay sons, their gay sons are three and a half times less likely to have unprotected sex than gay sons who were rejected by their parents. And that's research that was published in Pediatrics by Caitlin Ryan and Rafael Diaz a couple of years ago. And so we're, we're trying to get federal policymakers to you know, encourage parental acceptance and challenge anti-gay rejection or prejudice as a public health threat. Um, and in terms of um, prevention with women, um, we also have some recommendations about that. Um, and I think a key thing is to address some of the structural drivers of vulnerability that, you know, that, that are involved in the fact that black women are 15 times more vulnerable to HIV than white women. There are structural causes of that. They, they're very complicated. They have to do with you know, the criminal justice system, the disproportionate impact of, of you know, prisons on poor black communities. And so addressing some of the barriers to reintegration for people leaving prison that make it really hard for people who've done their time to reintegrate could really, um, could really address that. And it's sort of a secondary or tertiary impact, but it, it, I think it's really necessary and we have to move beyond just saying, use a condom. Um, so those are some of the ideas. Let's see, the next person I had was the gentleman with the beard, uh, the glasses there. Krishna, um, yeah. Can you just raise your hand again? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'll be brief. My name is Mark Skyler. Um, I have four disabilities. I'm HIV positive. I have chronic depression. I'm divorced with adult children. And I have lived with quite a number of the statements that are talked about a long-term survivor. 
what bothers me the most about most of the campaigns that I see in this building, and this is my universe, it has saved my life. Plain and simple. What bothers me the most is that I'm nowhere on any of the walls in this building. There is no one there who looks like me. There is no one talking to me about the problems of those four hidden disabilities and what I can do about them as a grown man. And being divorced, I'm now a second class citizen. And being divorced with children, I'm a third class citizen. I have a lot to be depressed about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, sir, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> There's been a lot of, uh, my name is Alan, Alan um, there's been a lot of wonderful comments here. Um, I'm just trying to put it all together in my brain what I actually want to say and the question I want to ask, but um, I saw the articles, yeah, the articles that were outraged about this public service announcement before I actually saw the, the, uh, the, the PSA. And of course I jumped immediately online to see this, this outrageous PSA and after it was done, I thought I missed what was outrageous about it. I wasn't stunned, I wasn't terrified, and I'm not sure if it's because um, I remember all the early articles in the early 80s about HIV or, or GRID, I remember all the early campaigns, I remember all the friends who died, so it seemed to me that a campaign that's getting people talking about something that is on the back burner, HIV is on the back burner now, is a successful campaign. Um, but very quickly, Given growing condom fatigue in the community that I'm observing very casually, I've never heard any, any surveys about it, that uh, bear bathing seems to be a very popular, acceptable, and growing practice in the community, I'm wondering what the panel or anyone in the audience would think a uh, uh, successful campaign would be to address what's actually going on in the community and the potential impact it has on the community. And how would you measure that? Thank you. Any panelists want to take on the last? <clears throat> I, you know, a, a number of people recently have mentioned uh, health disparities and you know what about this group, what about that group, and you know I think that this is uh, you know we're talking about social marketing campaigns. I'm you know a true believer. Um, unlike you know other people, I really do feel like they have a big impact and are really important to defining the dialogue and creating <coughs> social norms and, uh, and, I, and I think they can be very effective. But the reality is, is you know we're kind of fucked when it comes to HIV lately. You know funding is cut. We have incredible health disparities. I mean, it, it's so much of this is rooted in racism and homophobia and self, you know, low self-esteem, you know, I, I think what you said about hearing the preacher for 20 years telling you you're an abomination uh, is very telling, you know? And so, you know, these are structural changes and these are political issues and these, you know, they have to do with, you know, changing the fabric of this uh, country that we live in. And I, and I think there's some progress in that regard, but. But I think we have to look like we did so many years ago in, into our own community. And how are we dealing with each other? How are we